it is recorded. Yep, it is recorded. So we want to thank everyone that's on for coming to which I predict would be a very interesting uh, presentation or interesting seminar. And quite frankly, reading the biography life story of this young scientist is very inspiring to me. And so uh, just on that basis, I think we are privileged to have her with us. However, as you guys all know, we have a co-host, um, one of you, Zoe Gentles is our co-host today. And she's been wanting to do this. <laughs> she, she didn't have to be forced to do this. She was like, can I, can I, can I please? <laughs> She was eager to do this. So Zoe, um, I've known Zoe now for the last two, three years. She was uh, in organic chemistry class. I think that was last year. This year she is a teaching assistant in organic chemistry. And she is originally from East Lyme, Connecticut. She's a junior here, chemistry major, minor in data science. Hey, I didn't even know we had <laughs> Andrews. Okay, data science. It's important field for sure. Um, and she uh, is doing research with Dr. Alberg, one of my colleagues, doing analysis of DL amino acid ratios in eggshells. And she uses reverse phase high pressure liquid chromatography to do that. Uh, jo Zoe's uh, future plans includes epidemiology with an emphasis on genetics and um, or computational epidemiology. Um, so she's uh, fascinated with that field, it seems like. And uh, her hobbies, hobbies are interesting here. Bacon and violin. Do you do both at the same time, Zoe? No, my mother wouldn't love that. <laughs> Okay. Are you in a band or something? I used to be in orchestra, but because of the lab. <laughs> because of lab. You had to sacrifice. I had to put it on a hold for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So you were on in Andrew's orchestra, is what mm -hmm. you think. Oh, okay. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, so it's your turn to introduce our speaker today. All right. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, our speaker Dr. Murray Camariza, a tremendous force in the field of bioscience. Dr. Camariza is currently a junior fellow at the Society of Fellows at Harvard University and a co-founder and CEO of the biotechnical company Ollie Lux Bioscience Incorporated. Dr. Camariza was born and grew up in Bujumbura, um, Burundi. As a child, she was fascinated with space. She read anything space related that she could get her hands on. During her childhood, she witnessed infectious diseases like AIDS and TB devastate Africa. What she witnessed then is what influenced her research interests in the college. She immigrated to the U.S. at the age of 17. She began working while simultaneously taking courses at San Diego Mesa College. Her first couple of years in the U.S. were hard as she spoke little English, but with the help of a, of a French-speaking chemistry professor at Mesa College, she overcame that language barrier. The same professor encouraged her to transfer to UC San Diego, where she graduated in 2012 with a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry and Chemistry. While at UC San Diego, one of the few women of color faculty members encouraged her to apply to graduate school at UC Berkeley. She was accepted and earned a Master's of Science in Molecular and Cell Biology from UC Berkeley and earned a PhD in Biology from Stanford University. During her time at Stanford, Stanford University, she developed a new speedy an expensive test that can, that can detect TB. The newly developed reagent binds to the pathogen, causing it to become fluorescent in such a way that shows it what type of resistance it has. Most importantly, the test and analysis can be done at the initial point of care, assisting in swift action to prevent more cases. As a result of her trailblazing work, she was awarded a grant by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bring this test to communities with high TB infection rates. In 2018, Dr. Camariza co-founded the biotechnical company Olilux Biosciences. 
The main mission of the company is to centralize and oversee various projects that are working on improving her point of care method for TB. Dr. Kamariza, I am thrilled and privileged to welcome you to Andrews University, and I would also like to thank you for accepting, accepting our invitation to speak with us today. Thank you very much for such a kind and comprehensive uh, introduction, Zoe. I'm, I'm very honored to be here, and I, I thank you very much for the invitation uh, to get to talk to you and tell you a little bit about my work. So without further ado, I guess I'll, I'll get started and, and, this, and sort of describe the work that I did. I started at Stanford University, um, and then uh, it is, continues to be ongoing uh, through my company, Olilux Biosciences. So just to give you a bit of context, um, uh, prior to the pandemic, tuberculosis or TB, was the leading infectious killer caused by a single pathogen. And in fact, uh, even now, uh, TB is the second leading infectious killer caused by a single pathogen that is behind only COVID-19. So here is a map illustrating the global distribution of TB incidence. And what you can uh, hopefully notice is that it's quickly apparent that the incidence of TB cases is higher in developing countries where resources are already stretched thin. As Zoe mentioned, I'm, I was born in Burundi, and just to give you a, a, a geographic vi visual of where it is, it's sort of right here in the middle of East Central Africa, where TB is highly endemic. So what's worse is that with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, many of the TB control pipelines were rerouted to address this crisis. So for instance, at the beginning of the pandemic, an article in the New York Times asserted that the biggest monster that is spreading may not be COVID-19, but rather tuberculosis. And this is because resources like um, PPEs, like the, 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 all the outfit that the researcher here in this image is wearing, and the treatment pipelines, or even the health workers themselves that were in charge of keeping track of TB controlled, uh, were refocused towards pandemic management and patient um, and pandemic control. So as a result, any pre-pandemic progress in the area of TB control could be set back by years, even decades, as some experts suggest. Um, especially as TB incidents and TB mortality are predicted to rise. So we're already seeing a little bit of this. Um, here is the research letter that emerged uh, just last summer from the San Francisco Department of Public Health uh, that reported on an increase in TB-related hospitalizations and deaths compared to its pre-pandemic levels. And, and here, the, the speculation is that, you know, TB patients are waiting until they're very, very sick in, in order to seek uh, medical care. And, and we researchers and, and medical providers, we predict that this phenomenon is likely happening worldwide. And so as a result, uh, we're probably going to be seeing increased um, numbers over the next few years or a few decades. So this was just some context to tell you what's, you know, to give you a picture of what's the going on in the world of TB. But for the rest of my talk, uh, I'll focus on sort of the science that I performed and, and dig a bit deeper on the pathogen that actually causes tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis or MTB which is an infectious and obviously sometimes lethal bacteria that is transmitted through aerosol droplets, sort of similar to COVID-19. So these MTB cells, uh, and here's a schematic of how it would look like, um, they're sort of rod shaped uh, and are covered with a thick, waxy, highly hydrophobic and viscous cell surface. And, and this cell surface, uh, called often called the mycomembrane here, um, is a highly hydrophobic environment that plays a, a, a critical, essential role during pathogenesis. So for us scientists, studying the biochemistry of this particular uh, cell surface is a rich area of research, not just for diagnostics, but also for therapeutics. Particularly for my line of training as a chemical biologist, 
we were interested in building chemistry tools that could give us sort of a, a sneak peek into the architecture of the cell surface um, and, and report on the, the cell surface dynamics, particularly during, during infection of patients. And I'll just sort of quickly glean over the, the chemical, the chemistry principles that I, I followed to build these probes. Um, and please feel free to ask me any questions if any of this is unclear. So when we're designing uh, strategies to probe the micromembrane, we lean on the benefits of something we call bioorthogonal chemistry. And so here the idea is you take a molecule that is the natural component of uh, the micromembrane so say like a, like a sugar or, or lipid, and you chemically modify it with a handle that once inserted into the organism will selectively interact with a complementary reporter molecule of choice without disturbing the biological system. So here, in other words, in the scheme here shown on the slide, um, we can chemically append an exogenous substrate here as shown in the red um, like hexagon with a handle X, and then you feed the substrate into the cell where it gets presented on the cell surface, at which point then you can bring in a sort of complementary reporter with a handle Y. And X and Y will selectively interact together without disturbing the biological um, system. And you can uh, be able to detect it and report on the cell surface uh, in its native context. So for instance, here now you have the exogenous substrate that is appended with this um, fluorescent molecule that you can then, for instance, analyze using a fluorescence microscope. Um, so this idea, this chemical concept has been, had been leveraged to introduce a wide variety of fluorescence biomarkers. And so for instance, here uh, we, for MTB, mycobacterium tuberculosis, what we, what we use is a sugar called trehalose and trehalose is just a disaccharide, so do two glucose together. And trehalose was a, a, a appended with a fluorescence biomarker and then fed into the, the mycobacterium. And so the mycobacterium uses trehalose as a building block of the mycomembrane, and so it recognizes it and inserts it into the mycomembrane, at which point you can then be able to detect biofluorescence. So here, um, we, there's been many examples that had shown this. So there, this is one example where you have the trehalos that has been decorated with something we call an azide group. And the azetotrehalose gets inserted into the soft surface. And then you can bring in a bioorthogonal um, uh, a secondary molecule that will uh, interact with the azide and then load the fluorescence onto the cell surface. And the, here is how the image would look like under a fluorescence microscope. And so this was just not, that was not the only uh, one. There were many others that had been published and indeed had been uh, shown that you can have something as big and bulky as FITSE and it will still get into the cell and you'll still be able to detect it by uh, fluorescence microscopy. Now, this clever setup was very useful for research purposes, especially uh, understanding the architecture of the cell membrane, and indeed was already used to probe cell surface molecular dynamics. But the necessity to remove unmetabolized probe and the requirement for a two-step labeling process proved a major impediment as a diagnostic biomarker. And so this is where my PhD started and is where I came in and trying to uh, devise a strategy that would eliminate sort of this two-step process and eliminate the need to wash away on metabolized probe. So here the, 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 the basis of my hypothesis was um, what if we had a trehalose probe whose fluorescent signal would be specifically activated once inside the macro membrane. And therefore we wouldn't need to have a secondary probe that comes and labels the, the bugs. So in this presentation, I am gonna describe the work leveraging environment sensitive probes um, and it, to, to label mycobacterium tuberculosis. And, and I hope that I can convince you that these types of probes uh, offer a suite of desirable attributes that make them very well suited for point of care diagnostics. So 
what are environment sensitive probes? Um, these types of probes are a special class of uh, molecules that can change their fluorescence intensity uh, or color based in response to the change in their microenvironment um, polarity or viscosity or molecular order. So here is a, a, a particular example of a molecule that we ended up using throughout um, my PhD, DMN. Uh, and this DMN molecule is non-fluorescent in aqueous solution, and, and it becomes highly fluorescent in hydrophobic environment. So what we we noticed its acute sensitivity for the environmental polarity, and so we decided to try to insert it into this mycobacterium tuberculosis detection system to see if we can um, uh, design a quick and sensitive detection of mycobacteria. So the reasoning is, what if you have the trihalos, and this time you just put DMN onto the trihalos, and the trihalos would not, the DMN trihalos now, called DMN tray, would not, not be fluorescent up until it gets inserted into the mycomembrane, where we know is a highly hydrophobic environment. And ideally, we would get the DMN sense the environment and turn on fluorescence. So again, so in other words, the DMN trihalose molecules will be converted to trihalose microlates here. So there is a lipidation process that is uh, mediated via this particular protein. And then once they're lipidated, it gets inserted in the micromembrane and you get fluorescence turn on. So we went ahead and tested this directly where we, I, I synthesized DMN trihalose and then I tested uh, the level of fluorescence in different solvents with different polarity. So here I have just a solution with water. Um, and then uh, I have increasing concentrations of dioxane, which is an oil-like solvent and is uh, hydrophobic. And I was, uh, essentially the question here was, um, what are, what's the fluorescence output when put in these different increasing concentrations of, of dioxane? And so what we observed to our surprise actually was that we presence of more than 1% water um, was enough to quench fluorescence from uh, DMN trihalose. So here again, this is a 99.9% .9 dioxane solution, so less than 1% water. And you see this nice big green fluorescence peak, but any of the other ones, including 99% dioxane, um, you don't see, you see a quenched fluorescence from DMN trihalose, suggesting that it's highly sensitive to presence of water in the, in the environment. And so we were actually, at this point, where I was kind of worried about my PhD because uh, I thought this wouldn't work in a biological system that is basically surrounded with um, water-like like molecules. And so we, I, 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 I almost gave up, but then I went ahead and tested it anyway and, and tried to check whether it would work. So I set up a very simple experiment um, where I had a stock of my DMN trihalose, and then I had a culture of these mycobacteria, and I'll show you how they look in a second. Um, and then I essentially just added the probe onto the culture, waited for 30 minutes, and then imaged with a fluorescence microscope. And so this, these are the images that I, I took that very first day of, of experimentation. And so as I mentioned, so the, these are how the cells look like under bright field uh, of the microscope. So here we have like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, five cells. Um, and, and, and here they're swimming in a buffer containing the DMN trihalose. And what you can appreciate looking under the fluorescence channel is that we only see fluorescence from the um, probes that have been inserted into the cell. Again, remember that there is probes all over around the cell and within the cytoplasm of the cell, but we don't see any of those uh, being fluorescent because they were being quenched by presence of water, um, both uh, outside and inside. But we are seeing these cell surface specific uh, probes that have been inserted into the micromembrane. And you can see like these little dots is where um, it, ha it has been uh, reported that that's where the location of the end, the protein that is in charge of loading it onto the micromembrane lo uh, localized. 
again, suggesting that if this is um, these probes are being installed onto the cell surface. So just to give you a comparison of how it would look like if we we're using some of the already published uh, fluorescence mole trailers molecules, I did a, a, an experiment where I followed the exact same protocol and I had my probe and I had the, the fluorescein probe that I mentioned before. And what you can appreciate is that um, you get overwhelmed with unincorporated probe and you can barely tell if there are bugs in there and whether they're labeled. And here, you know, I tried different kinds of molecules that I knew had this ability of, of putting, um, of had the micromembrane and had this ability of putting a lipid onto the sugar. And now because of the simplicity of the labeling, we can actually do this in real time. We can look right as you have the cells on the, on the stage of the microscope, you can just add a drop of the, of the probe and actually just watch it essentially turn green. And so this is what I did in the series of images where I captured images at different time points. And so you start noticing where the first dots of fluorescence are coming in from. And this uh, corresponds nicely with where we think or we believe that the protein that makes the micromembrane resides. And then as you keep watching over time, you see the green uh, fluorescence sort of coat the whole surface as it keeps making more and more uh, 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 sugar glycolipids that are part of the micromembrane. Um, and using some, you know, the bottom one is a, a different strain that is a faster grower. And for this one, we noticed that the dynamic, the rate at which it was inserting uh, DM and trailers into the cell surface was much faster than, than this bug here on top. And so by the third minute of in insertion on, uh, of exposure to DM halos, we saw that the whole cell surface was already covered. So from a research standpoint, these probes can now permit us to ask re in incredibly uh, specific questions around uh, the, the turnover dynamics of the cell surface. Um, and then I did, you know, some more um, simple characterizations of the labeling. So for instance, here, this is a quantitative uh, experiment where I essentially took um, uh, uh, each sample had about 100,000 or a million cells and I labeled them and I measured what the fluorescence output was at, at each of these incubation times. And we noticed that within 20 minutes, it was enough to actually get enough fluorescence of the background um, that, uh, that is easily detectable. And then we also confirmed that within 30 minutes, we had about 80% uh, of the cell that were already labeled. So the great vast majority of the uh, present cells were already labeled within a few minutes of the incubation. And then we really wanted to prove though that this labeling was specifically going into the cell surface via this um, enzymatic pathway, because that's what's gonna prove that it's specific to this type of bacteria. Instead of just having the DM entrehalos sort of, uh, intercalate on, or sit on top of the cell surface and being turned on that way. So what we did, we set up a simple experiment where I truncated the sugar. Remember, trailers is a disaccharide with two glucose attached to each other. Um, and so I truncated and I just removed one of the glucose and so I made, and I made a DMN glucose version. And so this version ideally would not be able to be recognized and would not be put on the cell surface. And I set up the experiment and what you can uh, observe is that with DM halos, we have a nice high increase in fluorescence output, but with the DMN glucose, we don't see any labeling. Again, suggesting that trehalose pathway is actually critical for this uh, uh, labeling and is therefore specific to bacteria, to this type of bacteria. I did it in a different way too, where I just uh, competed away my probe with free trehalose. And so as you increase the concentrations of free trehalose, ideally you would compete out or dilute out the concentration of my probe. And so you would see a stepwise reduction of the fluorescence intensity. And that's obviously what we saw, um, as you can see on the slide. Um, and then next we wanted to see, well, you know, my goal was to use these probes in a biologically complex um, sample. So say like, a you know, like a saliva from a human or a sputum sample. 
And you know, human saliva have loads of microbes in them. And we wanted to make sure that these other uh, types of bacteria will not label with um, microbe. Because otherwise it would make for a very poor diagnostic reagent. So that's essentially what I did. I tested a, a following some of the non-mycobacterial species that I knew did not recognize trehalos. So here I'm showing, you know, E. coli, B. subtilis, Staph aureus, Listeria. We tested Salmonella. We tested a wide variety of bugs. Um, and what you can appreciate is basically none of these that I'm showing, at least in the slides, were labeled with DMA and trehalos. Again, suggesting that it's specific to uh, the types of mycobacteria that I talked about, mycobacterium tuberculosis and coronabacterium glutamicum. And then I wanted to go ahead one step further and I mixed all of these bacteria together with a, um, a red labeled uh, mycobacterium that, is, uh, that could be easily detectable uh, in, in a, you know, under my fluorescence microscope. And here the question was, um, if it's in a sea of other bacteria, will I be able to specifically detect mycobacterium? And so I labeled, I had this, you know, a, a culture of different types of bacteria. I had my DNA stain to see all types of bacteria that were in my, my, my culture. And then I knew which one was mycobacterium because it was red. And then I had uh, my DMA labeling. And what you can appreciate here in Emerge is that we did not see any of the other types of bacteria labeled. Or we only saw the mycobacterium smegmatis in this case, that turned green, suggesting again that there is a highly, this is a highly specific labeling. But, um, and then the last step that I checked um, before getting into the more clinical aspect of the, the, this project um, is whether this was selective for live cells. And so something that I mentioned earlier is that the, the trahillus has to be inserted into the cell surface dynamic. But that process is actually mediated by an enzyme. It, it requires recognition of the sugar and then and after recognition, it requires lipidation, and then that gets inserted into the um, mycomembrane. So we hypothesized that because we needed an active enzyme, it obviously required that the cells must be alive. So uh, I tested this question of whether DMA trails would be, would be label live, would distinguish between live versus dead cells in a couple of ways. The first way was to heat kill cells. So I incubated cells at a high temperature for 30 minutes. And then I, I did, you know, my simple protocol, add a drop of DMA trails, incubated for 30 minutes, and then analyzed by microscopy. And these are the results. Um, again, I had my red as a strain for this. And what you can see is if there's no heat, you can see nice labeling. Um, but if there is heat uh, before you label, you actually won't get any um, significant fluorescence of a background. And we, we confirm this using quantitative um, experiments where these are heat killed and you don't see, like if it's untreated, you see an increase in fluorescence over a, a background. But here, if it is uh, heat killed, it doesn't matter. If you add DM and trehillos, you actually won't see any for increase in fluorescence of a background. And then we went ahead and tested a different way, and this time is more clinically relevant, where we uh, incubated the cells with a drug cocktail. And the drug cocktail that is essentially what is given to patients in, in hospitals. So here we have a drug cocktail that includes the four, um, three of the four frontline TB drugs, and one which at the time was being um, considered as a new novel therapeutics for tuberculosis. And I built this cocktail, and then I, uh, I pre-treated the cells with a drug cocktail, and then I added my, a drop of my probe, incubated, analyzed. And these are the results. And what you can see, if there is no presence of the drug, um, you see a nice labeling as before. But if there is presence of the drug, you, you lose the fluorescence um, uh, increase because the cells are dead and they actually no longer recognize trehalose and they no longer are building their cell surface. And of course, we, we confirm this by uh, quantitative experimentation. 
I went ahead and, and, and sort of teased these apart a bit better where I did more monotherapy. So here, instead of having a drug cocktail, I actually just had a single mono cocktail. So riff, rifampin, isoniazid um, are both two of the four frontline drugs that are being used for tuberculosis uh, treatment. And then the SQ109, which at the, time, at the time was being considered as a good candidate. And then I, I, I tested them at different concentrations of these drugs. And then what you can see, or at least we can appreciate from this um, uh, data point at the other side is that what you, with increasing concentrations of these drugs, you see a stepwise decrease in labeling or fluorescence output, indicating that more and more cells are dying and therefore you will see less and less of them being labeled. But what if we had a drug resistance strain? How would that look like? So I wanted to, uh, to, to ask, precisely ask this question by using one of the better known um, drug treatment, um, uh, isoniazid. And the way isoniazid works uh, is it's a, itself as it is, it doesn't actually function. It needs to be cleaved off and turned into an active compound that will then go into the cytoplasm and actually kill the cell. And the cleaving, this cleaving um, step is performed by this um, protein called CAT-G that is naturally present in mycobacterium. And so uh, we, we tested, well, what if we had a, a strain that did not have CAT-G and therefore was immune to the effects of isoniazid, would we see any labeling, um, uh, any change in labeling with DM intrahalos? And so just again, to remind you, um, I have a drug susceptible strain here, and I have a um, solutions that uh, have DM intrahalos labeling, and then have been pre-exposed with isoniazid at increasing concentrations. And just as I mentioned before, um, you see a stepwise decrease in uh, fluorescence output because with increasing drug concentrations, cells are dying and they're not labeling. And then we designed this uh, uh, isoniazid uh, immune cell or drug resistant uh, cell, and then did a, performed the exact same experiment. And what we observe is that with this drugs resistant strain, um, it was unaffected. The, the geometry labeling of this strain was unaffected by isoniazid treatment. So regardless of the concentrations of isoniazid that you have in the solution, the labeling will be the same, uh, suggesting that actually DM intrahalos could be used to tease apart which bugs are uh, drug susceptible, like this one here, or drug resistant, like this one here. Uh, and in particularly um, to monitor drug treatment response in TB patients and, and importantly inform medical decision rapidly at the point of care. So just to wrap this, to wrap this section of the talk, um, I completed it by confirming all of what I've told you before using mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I, I, you know, I donned all the PPE that you saw on the New York Times image where I had the, the coveralls, the goggles, and I went into a facility, the biosafety level three facility to work with mycobacterium tuberculosis. I confirmed that um, if you expose mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, to drugs and then follow the labeling with DM intrahalos, you actually, you, you don't get labeling, again, suggesting that it's specific to live cells. Um, and it, it, it also worked in a one-step labeling procedure. So just to give you a comparison with the currently used methods to diagnose uh, tuberculosis at the point of care, I also set up the same experiment with the ORMI, and this is the currently used smear stain. And what you can appreciate here is regardless of whether there is presence of drug or not, um, these mycobacterium tuberculosis cells were, were labeled um, with oramine, and therefore oramine is actually unable to distinguish between live from dead cells, unlike uh, DM intrahalos. And what's, what's more is that oramine is a seven-step labeling procedure, so and pretty laborious, and, and DM intrahalos labeling is, is a one-step pr labeling procedure, which could be easily implemented, and it would be much simpler to perform at the point of care. 
So here, you know, I hope I've managed to convince you that DMA and Trey is actually a, a, a reagent that offers a suite of desirable attributes that fit well as a potential diagnostic biomarker. The first and foremost, it already uses existing equipment that are available in, in community health clinic, for instance, like uh, for instance, microscopes. Um, and it labels quite rapidly. So you could get potentially results within the same day or within even the same hour. Um, it can, because of the simplicity of the labeling and the detection, it could be easily automated. And importantly, because it distinguishes between life and dead cells, it could be used to, tr to monitor treatment efficacy even outside of hospitals. So I didn't want to stop here. <laughs> I wanted to go ahead and actually test this out in the field. And I, so I set up a collaboration or rather multiple collaborations in South Africa, and I'm just going to highlight some of them here today. So before I get going on, on this set of the uh, slides here, I just wanted to give you some context. Um, it had been close to a century since the last time smear microscopy for TB diagnosis had been improved. Quite literally, the protocols and the dyes used today for TB smear testing uh, in endemic countries like my home country of Burundi are the same ones that were used uh, 100 years ago. So, you know, needless to say that this is an area of, of uh, that could that needed much improvement uh, and modernization of technology. So given the unique features of DMA and Trihalos, um, I was incredibly excited at the potential of using this probe as a diagnostic tool and possibly as a biomarker to report drug resistance early, which is a major problem. Um, TB drug resistance is a major problem in endemic countries like Burundi. So, um, so I set up collaboration with Professor Bavesh Khanna at Witts University in Johannesburg and his postdoctoral trainee, Christopher Eland, both are, are shown on the slides here. And we, we set up a collaboration together to test whether we can actually detect mycobacterium tuberculosis in uh, patient samples and particularly uh, sputum samples. So we, set, we, we followed a, a simple protocol. We connected with nurses and medical providers in, in um, Soweto, which is on the northern part of uh, Johannesburg. And um, they, we collected samples from patients that were mine workers where uh, tuberculosis, there was a tuberculosis outbreak at the time. So we got the samples. Uh, the nurses helped us do the initial sputum collection and decontamination on site in the clinic. And then we took the samples, went back to the university in the research laboratory and performed either uh, DM entry labeling or the currently used or immune smear testing. And then it performed uh, imaging with using a fluorescence microscope. And this was right before the pandemic. Um, and these are some of the early images that we collected from those sample sets. And what we can readily see is that the, um, the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells are readily detected um, uh, that were labeled with DMN trihalos. We also set up um, another collaboration uh, looking at DMN uh, at mycobacterium tuberculosis cells that were not in sputum, but in blood samples. And so for TB detection, oftentimes patients are asked to provide a sputum sample. A sputum is like a cough sample. And, and, and then they can do a, a smear detection like the one I just showed you, and you can detect uh, intact cells. But in some cases, patients are co-infected with um, uh, HIV and tuberculosis. And so for immune compromised patients, they are often unable to produce a sputum sample uh, because they, can, they all actually don't produce a sputum in the lungs. And so what often happens for these uh, patients is they, they have to use the blood. Um, and so the, the testing has to happen on the blood, on the blood sample. The uh, problem often happen, at least in South Africa, um, is that patients that are co-infected with HIV, they get sicker much quicker. And if there is a drug resistance case, um, the, 
the not, the inability to be able to detect drug resistance early is actually um, can be a, a, a fatal in some cases because patients often die quicker. And so having a reagent that is able to report on drug resistance quickly and early in patient samples, blood samples, would be incredibly revolutionary in a context of HIV, HIV and TB patients. So we set up a collaboration to test this out. It had never been done before. And actually, oramine does not detect mycobacterium tuberculosis in, some, in blood samples. But we wanted to try it anyway. Um, so we collected blood samples, retrieved the plasma from these blood samples, incubated with our reagents overnight, and then set up the imaging. And we were incredibly surprised to see, to readily visualize MTB cell, cells in blood. So here are some of the images that were collected by David, uh, the uh, postdoctoral fellow who worked with me on this. And, um, and this was the first time that we have, uh, that the, has, this has been reported, that you can actually see images uh, from, of mycobacterium tuberculosis from TB blood samples. Um, and the, the problem was that you, you, there were no reagents to do this in the first place. And now we can, because we can now readily visualize um, a mycobacterium tuberculosis cells in blood samples, we can perform really cool research questions like looking at the morphology of these uh, intact um, mycobacterium tuberculosis cells in blood samples, understand how they change or behave in different drug treatment contexts, and of course, detect them early, uh, detect whether they're drug susceptible or drug resistant early to hopefully inform and support the medical providers for medical decisions. And so this paper has actually just been accepted yesterday. So it will be coming out very soon and we'll share with the community um, very soon. One of the things I learned though for my time in South Africa was that DMN trailers, while incredibly useful at detecting mycobacterium tuberculosis, the dye itself was quite dim. And the, the fluorescence microscope that I was using at Stanford were, were actually quite powerful and it didn't really matter that the dye was on the dimmer end. But when I, when I was in Johannesburg and then in Durban, South Africa, the, some of the microscopes that they were using were, were um, uh, made from the 80s or, or even on the cheaper end. And so they didn't have the higher resolution to be able to readily detect DMN uh, easily, particularly as I was proposing this for a diagnostic um, a biomarker at the point of care, I needed, I need this probe to be very, very bright. So when I flew back to Stanford, I went back to the drawing board and I and I search for a brighter dye that works similar to DMN and could uh, have the same attributes as DMN trahalos to be able to detect mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I, you know, I'll, this is a paper that was published last year that described all this work, um, but I'll, I'll spare you the reading the whole paper. I'll just tell you quickly that we scanned a bunch of different molecules um, we landed on this particular type of uh, molecule called the hydroxychromone, and we uh, landed on this particular one that seems to be the brightest of them all and seemed to retain the specificity and sensitivity uh, labeling uh, metrics uh, similar to DMN trihalos. Because it's so much brighter, uh, we, we quantified this and we showed that when in comparison to DMN trihalos, we see that the, hy the hydroxychromone dye was about 10x brighter than DMN trihalos. So just to give you like uh, a, um, the context of why this is important, I sent this new probe to Christopher Eland at Witt University in Johannesburg, and I asked him to do a side-by-side -side comparison on, on their fluorescence microscope. And so here are the images that he collected. And these are different concentrations of the dye, so from low to high, and then DMN trihalos and 3-hydroxychromone trihalos. What you can see is that for DMN, you don't actually see the bug up until the highest concentration of the probe. But for the hydroxychromone, we see the labeling even at the lowest concentration that he tested. 
again, showing that the brightness of the dye changes the paradigm of detection uh, using the system. And because we can easily detect them now, we can actually detect them much quicker too. So what? Um, so for diametra hills, what I had determined is that it, it took at least an hour for labeling for the labeling to be significantly high enough for me for us to detect. But with the hydroxychromone, we showed that even at the lowest time that we incubated the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells, we could see significant fluorescence of a background, um, suggesting that we could potentially. Uh, detect uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis cells from patient samples within 10 minutes of incubation at the point of care. So next, I also wanted to uh, improve the detector. And so here we partnered with the bioengineers at Stanford University to build, uh, of, uh, to build a device, a detection device that could go along with our probes. It could be used outside of the clinic. And this had been my dream all along is to have sort of a, like a, self-sufficient, a self-contained unit that could be put in a backpack and that a community health worker could use um, outside of the hospital or outside of the clinic to find patients where they are, especially now during the pandemic. So we built a low-cost uh, battery-powered uh, portable mini microscope. And this is the Im an image that shows the first prototype. Um, and it's essentially, it has all the essential components of a fluorescence microscope, right? So it has a camera, it has the lens, it has a filter set, objective, and a stage, of course, and a little um, laser so that it can excite the fluorescence. It's very small, it's about the size of a tissue box. Um, it can do the automated image collection and image analysis, and it, it runs on batteries, and it can last about a day under active use, which is very important for someone who's outside of the clinic and needs to be able to continually run these sample sets um, at, right at the special bed, um, bedside, patient bedside. And what was really important for me is that didn't, I didn't want this device to require any special training. So we spent a lot of time building the back end hardware and software to be able to support no special training required. And right now we're really programming it so that it's, it works um, connected via Wi-Fi so you can send the data from remotely and, and pay people, patients and medical providers can find the results remotely. And so with this device, uh, we have done some microscopy experiments. And again, because of the sort of the low tech nature of it, labeling with diamantria halos is not as easily detectable, but with the hydroxy, much brighter hydroxychromone, you can now easily detect these labeled cells. And we can do some interesting quantitation analyses with this um, device because again, of the back end uh, work that we've done. Um, and, and just right now we're working on the programming aspect to be able to automate the image analysis and the, and the output, the result, the output of the results. So here you have the image, automated image acquisition, backend cleaning of the image, um, some coding to be able to spin out, you know, spit out some, some graphics like this that then the medical provider um, can explain to the patient what the results are. So in summary, these environment-sensitive probes show great promise as biomarkers for tuberculosis detection and tuberculosis drug resistance uh, detection at the point of care. So for instance, I've shown you that diametrohalos permits the no-wash one-step detection of live mycobacteria. Diametrohalos can detect mycobacterium tuberculosis in sputum and for the first time in blood samples. And Diametrialis has a, a really exciting potential as a, a reporter on, of cell viability um, in clinical samples and uh, for uh, drug susceptibility testing in clinical samples. So the brighter probes that I've shown you in the latter part of my presentation permits detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis within 10 minutes. 
and per, could potentially uh, be uh, uh, critical for the rapid assessment of MTB outside of hospitals using uh, Octopi TB, our, our detector that would work in conjunction with our probes. Um, and I think these probes could be very useful in low resource settings, and they already are in, in some context, especially now with the COVID-19 crisis. And that's why we launched a public benefit startup to quickly disseminate these probes to areas that could use them right away. We have collaborators and partners across the globe, as you see, as you can see in the slide, and we're all fighting together for those that may be left behind during this crisis. So given that diagnostics labs everywhere are swamped with COVID-19 testing, mobile diagnostics that require little training are more important than ever. And I think this will be true for a long time after the pandemic. And it, that's why I continue investing my time in building these types of probes for infectious diseases. So with that, I, I thank Carolyn Bertuzzi, who was my PhD advisor, continued and continues to work with me in the company. And all the many wonderful um, uh, Stanford people that has, uh, have contributed their thoughts and, and ideas to this project to get it to where it is. And I've only highlighted some of the collaborators I have. I have over 30 collaborators at this point, but um, here I've only highlighted my collaboration with Bavesh and, uh, and the Durban team and Manu Prakash, of course. Um, but all of us together are working to try to bring these probes where they need to be and, um, and improve the uh, patient outcome in, in, in the hospitals. Of course, I have to thank the funders and most importantly, I have to thank patients who have kindly donated their sample sets so that we can perform these analyses. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for listening and I'll take any questions now. I'll stop share so I can see you. Okay. Zoe, you could unmute. I see that there's a question in the chat already. Should I read it out? Well, first, sure. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So it says, does, um, does 3MH3, um, HC3 trahalos have the same property as the DMN trahalos that is activated only if embedded in the membrane? And why are these molecules easier to excite in hydrophobic environments? That's a very good question. Um, and so I, I this for the first question, um, yes, it, it is, 3 hydroxychromone is also conjugated to the trehalose, the sugar molecule that is recognized and inserted into the micromembrane. So in that sense, yes, the, the, trahal, the 3 hydroxychromone trehalose also gets delivered into the micromembrane and works similar to DMN in that it's only activated once it's embedded in the micromembrane. And why are these molecules easier to excite in a hydrophobic environment? That's a very good question. Um, there's a whole class of environment sensitive probes that work differently than others. Some of them are work, it, 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 it's based on the excitation state of, uh, of the photons that get emitted and they, they can be either quenched or uh, released depending on the environment, the environment that they're in. And there are others that actually respond to the change in environment by changing the, the emission, uh, emission wavelength. So they change their color essentially. Um, and others, uh, instead of actually of turning on fluorescence, they turn off fluorescence. So they're always fluorescent up until there's a change in their microenvironment and they become quenched. So it's a, it's a whole area of chemistry and lots of really exciting uh, as stellar chemists have spent their careers building these types of probes. And they're quite cool, honestly. So I, I had a um, couple of questions. Why, because I've seen in your presentation, um, other researchers using trehalos why trehalos? What is the, what is the, how does it bind to the membrane? Is it, is it more than just hydrogen bonding? What is, what is going on with this choice of trehalos? That's a very good question. Um, the shortest answer is, uh, is because we know how 
the biosynthetic machinery of Trujillo is much better than any other of the components of the mycomembrane or the cell surface. So what I didn't, I didn't get into too much of the biology here, but the, the biology of the stock surface is highly complicated, much more complicated than some of the other bacteria like E. coli. So there are different sugars that are intercalated with proteins and lipids and in a very complex web um, that makes the cell surface of mycobacterium tuberculosis very tough to get into. Hence why it requires four different drugs in order to treat patients. And, and, the, and so and from the research perspective, so there are different kinds of sugars that are a part of the cell surface and trahills was just the easiest one to do chemistry on, to be honest. It's easier to synthesize, it's easier to manipulate, um, and it's freely abundant in nature. There are other types of sugars uh, that are part of the mycomembrane and um, and other folks have been leveraging some of those sugars as well and other types of lipids as well. And in fact, in my own work, um, I, I talked about modifying the dyes, but there's also another aspect of my work where I modify the sugar and I modify the targets. And, and that's also ongoing, but Okay. In, initially, the reason why people were attracted to trahillus was just the simplicity and convenience of being able to work with it. Okay, okay. And um, as a follow-up to that too, how, how was the DM and trahillus synthesized? Did you start from the, um, was it the cyclic anhydride and did a reaction? How was that? How is that synthesized? It's a good question. Oh my God, I'm going to remember this. Um, I'm happy to send you the paper. I'll okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't remember how we made this. Yeah, because uh, I, I, at some point I we was, stopped making them and just had other chemists make them. But Yeah, I was looking it up and I thought that maybe it was because it's an imid and oftentimes it's made from the you know cyclic anhydride. Yeah. I will say that we did not make the dye from scratch. So the okay. dye is commercially available. Right. What right. we did have to do, we had to uh, make it clickable. So we needed to add an azi group onto the DMN so that we can then load on the trahalos, like okay. install the trahalos. Okay. But the DMN itself is commercially available. Right. I looked it up. Oh, and <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And as a synthetic chemist, I was starting to think, hmm, how was this made? So that's that's where that question was coming from. Yeah, yeah. No, I I did not make it from scratch, but okay. others have. Uh, like some of the earlier chemistry papers have made them from scratch. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Zoe, you wanna? Continue inviting people to ask questions. There's a um, question from Professor Warbeck, and he said, have you considered uploading the photos taken in the field to a central interpretation lab, or could an app he, um, be used to get reliable results in the field? That's a very good question, and yes and yes. Well, and we have not uploaded the images, but we are considering building a software tool that can go along the images to do the automated um, image analysis and quantitation, because you can actually just quantify how many cells are fluorescent, what the, what the metrics of those cells are, and that will inform the specificity and sensitivity and all that uh, jazz. Um, yes, we're working on that. We're absolutely working on that. Um, we have not, I'm not familiar with the place that they mentioned, um, the online database where we can publish these images, but the paper is coming out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So I have other questions too. So um, one is not about the research you presented, but actually opportunities for students. Do you, your company, which is a interesting, I've never heard about what, how, how do you describe it as a what type of company again? It's a public benefit company public that is benefit. primarily focused on just disseminating. Essentially the, the I was graduating and I was leaving and, and I had, at that point, I had maybe about 46 collaboration that were all asking us access to these probes. 
and we just needed to be able to maintain the, the accessibility to the probes. So it's a public benefit company that is benefit. has originally focused on dissemination. So that's is that different from a nonprofit company? I don't know. I, I, I'm just wondering. But my main yes. question, though, yes, in the sense that yeah, we can get investor money and grant money. Okay. Yeah. But my real question though is, do we do you have summer research opportunities for students that may be interested? And you know, working with you over the summer or something like that at your company. Yeah, email me. I'm there always looking for talented people. <laughs> there you Please go. email me. <laughs> Let me All your right. student here. Let's get a chat going on. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. There's one more question, I think. How how mm -hmm. did we go about finding DMN? Uh Good question. Short answer is they were already known, actually. Um, these environment sensitive probes have been had been published for at least two decades and had been used for a wide variety of things in polymer chemistry and polymer detection, um, in protein design and protein detection. It's just the, the connection with tuberculosis, infectious disease, and particularly diagnostics had not been made just yet. Mm -hmm. And and I think it it, it it required a chemist who who understood the literature and understood what we could do with it in order to make that connection. Mm -hmm. And how did we find it? We, we read papers. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it is a, a long um, list of, they call, call them also sulfatochromic dyes. Correct, the sulfatochromic yeah. dyes, yeah. 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 So another question I have is, so, are there just still only four drugs that are being used to treat TB? No, um, they are not cures, right? They, they just treat and manage TB, is that correct? Correct, to some extent, yes. Some patients do get cured, um, okay. meaning they're you know, TB negative. Okay. Um, but it, it's also difficult to assess because there are dormant, there's dormant TB as well, where people might have these cells that have just gone into a dormant phase and they can be inactive again sometime later in your life. But yes, it's still four frontline drugs. Um, there is also four second, uh, second line drugs that can be used in the case of drug resistance. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of drugs that are actually coming out of clinical trials, bidaquiline being one of them, and they seem to be uh, to have reasonable uh, efficacy. And I think they will start, either they will start or they have already started testing them in patients. Um, but you know, now that we have COVID-19 vaccine, there's lots of talks about TB vaccine and malaria vaccine. So mm -hmm. presumably over the next two to three decades, will be able to actually make a huge dent in these numbers. So are you saying that there is no TB vaccine at this point, no effective? Not, no effective uh, TB vaccine for adults. So there is a BCG vaccine that works uh, with reasonable efficacy in children. So for instance, I had the BCG vaccine when I was a kid, uh, but it doesn't work for adults. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, so there's a whole room for more research in this whole area. Yes, and more funding, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> okay, so you have other questions people are asking? Um, I think I see one more question. This is, this DMA trahalose also detect the cells that have gone dormant. Is there any scenario where the enzyme that adds the sugar to the membrane gets turned off? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Also, there's a, a question above that, I think. Yeah. Oh, what is the probability of the probes operating on a solar power batteries? Hmm. That's a very good question. And I, I think it could work. It's just a matter. It's a question of engineering. Mm -hmm. um, that is now in my head that I'm going to keep thinking about. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's a good question. It's I'll hold good. on to that question. Hopefully I have an answer for you. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. yeah. And the next one is, uh, does, 
Let's see the tech cells that have gone dormant. That's a very good question as well. And we often get that question with clinicians as we're presenting this work. And the short answer is if the patients are not producing sputum that has these cells, we are likely not to detect them. So it's, it's a matter, it's a mechanical uh, issue rather than uh, a reagent issue. It's just, we need to have presence of these bugs in the sample set. And if they're dormant, the patients are not producing sputum, then unfortunately it wouldn't work. Is there a possibility instead of doing um, the, the, um, the cough test, or I'm gonna call it, is there a possibility to do like um, a swab in the mouth or anything like that in order to detect using your- Yes. Um, Absolutely, especially now with COVID-19, we've been getting that kind of question. Um, can you use swabs to do detection? And the question is, do, uh, can we collect intact cells with swabs? Um, unclear. Mm. So we need to we need to do the research first. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Any anybody else has questions? In fact, you guys could. If you have a question, unmute and, and ask it too. Anybody else? Oh, I had a quick question too. Sure. You mentioned uh, before it was like a seven step process to detect this. And um, so I was wondering, are there, like, is there a lot of other stuff? Like, have you looked towards like, you know, like changing what, like kind of reproducing what you did with a different, with detecting different illnesses and different types of cells and stuff like that? Or like have other like, has your research kind of like spawned a new, a new section or like a lot of people like trying to do that now? Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yes, we have partnered with a few folks to try to look at other types of infections. Hmm. Some of them that did not have any reagents for the point of care diagnostics in the first place. And now all we can do is just, all we need to do is load the dye onto a different carrier and be able to detect them. So in that sense, yes, there's a, a few different projects that have spawned from that. Um, the other question was if this is a, a major area of research that has started. I don't know. <laughs> um, I am certainly working on this and I have collaborators working with us on this. Um, I, I hope that there will be uh, additional people that are interested in building this up because there's a, there's a clear uh, direct impact in the world of diagnostics and, and also therapeutics. Like right now I'm delivering these fluorescent probes, but you could also just load the trahalos with an inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the cells just die once it gets in. So there's a whole host of things that we can do with this line of work that I, I hope other scientists are, are interested in getting on. Very good. All right. Um, Ines, Anesta? Williams, you have a question? Who is Anesta Williams, um, Zoe? Do you know this person? We can have, have Anesta introduce herself. <laughs> Do you know this person, Zoe? I think so. This is phenomenal work, for, especially for poor countries who can't afford expensive tests. So as a former OR nurse, I have a question for you. Though uh, brain tuberculosis is rare, any thought that this may be something that you could use to test um, for brain tumors that are suspected to be tuberculosis? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I can't see why not. I think the issue here might be collecting the cells while, while maintaining viability. Mm. And if mm. it, it is possible to get those specimens and that have these live cells in them, Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. An interesting line of question, yes. Great question, Anesta. <laughs> it's my <laughs> OR nurse in me, can't help it. <laughs> we have, I have seen cases where we're doing a craniotomy and there is suspicion that this may be tuberculosis, though it's rare. And, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that there is an opportunity to spend a lot of resources on that. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see, but yeah. I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting the specimen, I think, might be the limiting factor here. All right, well, our audience is reducing. People have to go and do other things, but <laughs> this has really been interesting. And I do really hope some of the students listening today email you. 
<laughs> Please <laughs> email me. Yes. I'm always looking for people to work with me. Yes. It's a great opportunity to be on the cutting edge of science, biology, some chemistry, you know, um, it's, it would be a great opportunity, great experience. So we want to close off and thank you so very much. Continued success, meaning like helping the world. Thank you. Thank so you so much. Very and thank much. you for the invitation. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we'll stay in touch. Bye. Okay, bye bye.